We come together this morning to wait upon and to worship our God. You've already got the intimation sheet. I don't think there's anything of significance that I wish to draw attention to apart from the communion next Sunday evening in Tain. So let's commence our worship by singing together the praise of our God from the words of Psalm 89. Psalm 89 from page 344. And we're seeing from the beginning of that psalm and verses 1 through 6. God's mercies I will ever sing, and with my mouth I shall thy faithfulness make to be known to generations all. For mercy shall be built, said I, for ever to endure. Thy faithfulness even in the heavens thou wilt establish sure. I with my chosen one have made a covenant graciously, and to my servant whom I love, to David, sworn have I. And so on, we're singing verses 1 through 6, the first five stanzas, God's mercies I will ever sing. God's mercies I will ever sing, and with my mouth I shall thy Let us now call upon the Lord in prayer. Let us all pray. We come together, O Lord, and we assemble ourselves once more as a congregation of thy people seeking to praise and lift thyself up. For who is a God liketh unto thee? May that sense of wonder and awe be upon our soul as we think of the great works thou hast done the creation of all that is around us, thy superintendence of it from day to day, the ordering of our providences and the provision for our every need. But, O oh Lord, we would lift our gaze and our thoughts even higher than that at this time. For we come together here to look upon and to meditate on 
the work of salvation in Jesus Christ, thy Son. And as we do so, Lord, we know our own limitations. We know our own restrictions, spiritual as well as many others. And so we ask for the ministry of thy Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in every aspect, every sentence, every word of our worship here today, that we might be aware of thy presence amongst us, that we may be aware of thine assistance and help given unto us. Especially, Lord, we come out of the world with all of the pressure that bears down upon us in it. So many demands placed before us, we ask of thee, Lord, that we might be able to hold all of these things at arm's distance from us. For the example of the psalmist is the one we seek to follow. O thou, my soul, bless God the Lord and all that in me is. We ask then that we might know the way we would recruit and gather together our enthusiasm and our energy to the privileges we now have. But also, Lord, may we be exercised to revise and to, revi to visit once again our experiences in these past days of this week gone from us, that we might see the ways in which our lives have been decorated, filled out with thy provision. Only from time to time are we able to recognize that but there is so much we do not know. The lavish, abundant, <coughs> rich provision of our God for us. May we therefore be stilled and may we know what it is to call upon thy name out of knowledge, <coughs> joyfully, not merely out of routine or of habit, and we pray, Lord, that thou would be pleased to come amongst us. Do us good. We would wait upon thee as we would open thy word. Speak to us through it and from it. Each one of us alone and apart. Each one of us separated. We've come as families. We've come as friends. But, Lord, in our dealings with thee, we sit and stand alone. Speak to us, Lord, then, as thou dost know our character as well as our need. And the very blessings that we seek for ourselves, we pray, Lord, for those others who are not able to be with us here today. There's such a variety in ourselves as a community and congregation, those who mourn and who are sad. Death visiting our doors from time to time. Lord, in that particular situation, they're only here to comfort those who are alone and isolated at home, Lord, be a little sanctuary to them where they might be. Those who are filled with anxiety and concern because of things in the past and future days to come, Lord, may we know what it is to cast, <coughs> to cast all these anxieties upon thyself. And these very blessings, Lord, that we value and treasure for ourselves, the privileges that are ours here this morning. Multiply them, Lord, throughout the length and breadth of our land, other congregations, other communities. The need is the same no matter where we are found, for this gospel is for the healing of nations. So, Lord, come amongst us. Speak to us of spiritual tones and spiritual messages. And may we know what it is to return to the path we've abandoned and forsaken for so long that as a nation we might once again be known as the people of the book. So, Lord, gather us together, young ones and old ones. May we know this morning thy presence amongst us to bless us. And in all of thy dealings with us, Lord, deal with us in thy grace and pardon and forgive us our sin as we ask all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
I've got something to say, but I'm going to leave you where you are sitting, just so you can see everything that I'm going to do. I love everybody who comes up here, or not everybody, your minister anyway, always likes sweetie, so I thought the best thing to do is do the same. Liquors all sorts. And I want to focus particularly on the second description, all sorts, that all sorts. A pink one. Blue one, sparkles on the outside, you notice. Aye. A white one and a yellow one. A white one and a pink one. Oh, we had a blue one with sparkles. There's another pink one with sparkles. And there's one in here. I've got to get it out because <clears throat> it's part of what I want to say. A whole all sorts, <coughs> different sweeties. And no matter what descriptions we have given of them, there's something about all of these that I want to mention. They all have a black core. I'm not going to bite it, but it's the same with that one. And that one. And that one. There's a black streak running through them. All sorts. Well, all sorts of you and I in the congregation this morning. All sorts. We're all different characters, experiences, all different in our history. But there's something that's true about every one of us. We've all got that black center. We all got sin in our characters, in the way we live. It doesn't make any difference how different all of them are. We've all got sin marking us, spoiling us. All sorts. Some of us, in fact, are a wee bit different because there's black all the way through. But there's one particular liquor also that's so different from all the rest. That one. That one, yes, it's got the liquor on the outside, but see what it's got in the middle. It's got a white core. That one is so different. I'm going to put it over there because that tells me everything I want and I need to know about us and about Jesus Christ, the gospel. He has a perfect, white, pure center. But round about it, there's all the licorice, there's all the black, of one, two, three, four, six different types of people. Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, came to deal with our sin. And our sin has been wrapped around him, and he's taken it to the cross, and he's dealt with it. And the only person that could do that is Jesus, because he's the only one with a core, a pure, personal core to deal with our sin. So there you have it, all sorts. And the next time you go to Sweeties and you get a bag of all sorts, will you remember just what I said to you? Just the way in which it describes differences in humanity, difference in every one of us. But it focuses upon the one who's different in the most important way of all, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into the world to deal with our sin. And that leaves me with a problem. What am I going to do with this? I'll just leave them up here. And you might get them on the way out. Well, the kids might. Anyway. Let's continue our worship then by singing this time from the words of Psalm 36. 36 on page 251.
and we're singing verses 5 through to 10 of that psalm. Thy mercy, Lord, is in the heavens. Thy truth doth reach the clouds. Thy justice is like mountains great. Thy judgments deep as floods. Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How precious is thy grace. Therefore, in shadow of thy wings, men's sons their trust shall place. Psalm 36, and we're seeing from 5 through to verse 10, 5 stanzas. Thy mercy, Lord, is in the heavens. <clears throat> Thy mercy, Lord, is in the heavens. Thy truth and grace that's grown. Thy justice is like mountains great. Thy judgments deep as floods. Thou preservest man and be how precious little I will therefore thy judge all thy way when sons their trust shall place with the fatness of thy house shall be well satisfied from rivers of thy pleasures thou will drink to them provide because of life the fountain pure remains alone I want us to read this morning from the Old Testament Scriptures in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, and verses 1 through 23. I'm going to read from the Pulpit Bible, the, author, uh, the NIV, uh, it's on page 315. 2 Samuel, chapter 12. It's a familiar passage and experience that I want us to think of, of the sin with David and Bathsheba. And this passage tells us about the challenge that was brought to David because of what he had done. Let us therefore read and hear God's word. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little yow lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. 
It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the yow lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. <coughs> then David, then Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. <coughs> this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you must master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his size? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die, but because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized that the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lo lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and all, at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His servants asked him, Why are you acting in this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that it is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Amen. Amen. And we look to the Lord to give us understanding in that reading of his own holy word. We continue singing this time from the words of Psalm 37 on page 255, reading from and singing from verses 37 to 40. So it's Psalm 37 and at verse 37, page 255. Mark thou the perfect... And behold 
the man of uprightness, but cause that surely of this man the latter end is peace. But those men that transgress Israel shall be destroyed together. The latter end of wicked men shall be cut off forever. But the salvation of the just is from the Lord above. He in the time of their distress, their stay and strength doth prove. The Lord shall help and them deliver. He shall them free and save from wicked men. Because in him their confidence they have. Psalm 37 at verse 37 Mark thou the perfect. Mark thou the perfect and behold the Turn with me now to the book of Psalms and to Psalm 32. I'm going to preach from that psalm, so therefore I'm going to read it from the familiar version that I would be using of the authorized version, but you can try to follow me because I want to read the whole of this psalm first of all before we come to look at it and what it says. So it's Psalm 32, and it's only 11 verses that I want to read. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thine hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah, that word might not be there in the, in the NIV, but it's a phrase that's put in in the Greek and Hebrew just to make us stop and think of what has just been written. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with wings of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, 
all ye that are upright in heart. <clears throat> Some people are able to take in and to apply clear Christian statements, clear Christian teaching. It gets into the mind and they're able to break it down and to understand it and apply it. But there's others of us. We need more help. We need something concrete, something substantial in our hand that we can work out and handle for ourselves. We can identify with. We need flesh and blood examples. And that's the attraction of the book of Psalms because there the psalmist is opening up his own life of real lives of real people. He gives us a flesh and blood identity, something we can go to and look at. And it's, it's almost as if we've got, a, when we read about David, it's as if we're holding a mirror. Yes. Now I understand what God is doing to me because I see what it's done to him. God deals with him. We can identify with that. We can make sense of our own spiritual experiences at God's hand. We gather here together. And when we do so, God is putting distance between us and the world. Everything is left at the door of the church. He's pushing all the thoughts of yesterday and the plans of tomorrow. And he's addressing the spiritual side of your life and mine. We might come as family, we might come as friends, we might come in the pew we've been always sitting in, but just for these moments, it's just you and your God, me and my God. And what is God saying to us as he comes and the message is preached and proclaimed every morning? The gospel we have talks about the guilt of sin. The experience of conviction. The need to make a confession. The coming to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Having the experience of pardon and of peace. That's the thrust and the summary of the gospel we all are familiar with. But... What do all these words mean? <coughs> what do all these words mean? We've got social sciences. We've got computers. We've got all of the modern things that young ones are so familiar with. And <coughs> they throw words at the likes of me. And I don't understand what they're talking about. Because everything has its own vocabulary and its own terminology. Every trade has its own vocabulary and its terminology. And we've got to explain what the Christian vocabulary and terminology means. We've got to translate our words into human experiences. We must never, we must never allow the gospel to be pure theory. It must never be merely words. We've got to distill it and take it right down in here. <clears throat> what you and I are like and what God is addressing is in there. What does it mean to be converted? What's the feeling that goes with being convicted? David is going to open up his life and help us come to an understanding and an application of some of these terminologies and words. <clears throat> the background came from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. The sin he'd committed with Bathsheba. Saw her out one night. I was casting her. He was drawn to her. Went in with her. Slept with her. She brought the baby. All of that was what David did. It was wrong. And God is going to deal with it in him. So what David is doing here is he's unsipping his life. 
and he's letting us inside to see what he was like on the inside. And that's always what God does. When you go home, you're going to have cushions on your sofa, and you're going to look at them and say, well, that looks nice, and that one looks nice, and you're always going to be taken by what's decorating the room and things like that, and God says, no. God turns the cushion over and unsips the back of it, goes inside and looks what's inside the sofa cushion. That's what God is doing with us here and now. He's opening up our lives in the light of the mirror of David's life. And we can learn from him. Because David is looking back over about a year of his life just now. And he's telling us what he went through and experienced. It is a spiritual biography. And we have to press the stop button in our life. Press the stop button. The pace of life drags us along day by day, week by week, year in, year out. Press it now. And look back just for a while at what God might be saying to us through what he says to David. So therefore, how do we unpick David's experience given to us in this psalm? Well, the first thing I want us to think about is the picture and the pain of conviction. We've always got to start. People, people always think you've got to start with the good news. No. You've got to start with the bad news first. Because it's only when you hear and appreciate the bad news that you'll value and appreciate the good news. That's what the Lord did. The very first words that he preached in his first public sermon is, what was it? Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. People will come to us and say to us, oh, you preachers, you ministers, you Christians, you're always telling us the bad news, the bad things, the bad things about this, that, and the other. And they try to rubbish our message by misrepresenting our message. And here, David is aware of it, and he counters it. Because right at the very start of this psalm, right at the very start, he speaks not about the bad news, but the good news. He says, blessed. Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven. He starts with a jubilant note. But it wasn't always like that. Because David has been through a hard and difficult experience. And so he wants to tell us about that along the way. And it all focuses on that one sin with Bathsheba that night. For almost a year, he was silent. Life wasn't easy for him in that year. He tried so many different ways and devices to hide his sin, to avoid the consequences. Come on, Uriah, you're coming home from a battle. You're coming home from war. Go home. Spend the night with the wife. Didn't work. Next time he was home, he said the same thing, but he says, well, have a glass of wine. Go and get a bottle of wine and sit with the wife. Didn't work. Plan three. Okay. Okay. The next time you're in a battle, he spoke to his commander-in-chief. Next time you're in a battle, make sure that Uriah is in the hottest space possible. Make sure that he's there where the battle is more intense. Make sure he's there exposed to the most danger. And we all know why. And it happened just like that. Uriah was killed. There's no limit to what David would try to cover up his sin. And there's no limit to what you and I will try to do as well. You've just simply got to back, look back in your own memory. I, you, us together. We can try anything and everything. Duck and dive. Bob and weave. Just to get away from what God is saying to us. We try to run but we cannot hide. God stopped him in his tracks and painted a picture for his life. And the pain that it produced 
and we've got to take it and apply it to ourselves. He uses three simple brush strokes to paint this picture. Three simple brush strokes to paint the picture that applies to David. The first brush stroke, he says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. What does the terminology, what does the word mean, transgression? The word means rebellion. God clearly says, do not do this, and we go and do it. You've always got this sign, maybe we don't, maybe we do, a sign, wet paint. What do we do? We touch it. We'll try it. We'll see if it's wet. We'll always go on cross cross that line just to see how far we can get off with it. Don't walk on the grass. Kids see the sign. The first thing they do is they walk on the grass. The same with ourselves. We're prepared to push the envelope as far as we can. Rebellion. Open defiance. And even when it came home to David in his house, even when it comes home to us, we still try it. We're still trying to avoid the consequences of what we've done until God stops us and challenges us. The first brushstroke, transgressions. But then he goes on in that same verse. He speaks about whose sin is covered. What does sin mean? What's the terminology used here? Well, God has set out the path that we're to walk. God has set out what he requires from us. But we don't reach it. We don't obey him as we ought. We're always going our own way. And however careful we might be at trying to obey what God has said, however careful we are, we come short. It's like somebody with a bow and arrow, anything like that that needs careful aim. That's what we do. We take careful aim with a bow and arrow just to hit the bull's eye. And we always miss. That's what sin is, essence. We come short of what God requires from us. And God is constantly weighing us up and judging us. Back in Stormy, my father, we had a grocer shop. And every year there was always a stock taking. You let everything run down, just the essentials left on the shelves. But that time when you were taking stock, you had to go round every single thing that was in the shop. Write it down, make an assessment, come to a value of what it was. And God is taking stock of our lives from time to time. He's weighing us up, assessing what we've got, and coming to a judgment. He's measuring us in the scales that he has provided. And so often, we come short. God, here and now, is weighing us up. Transgression. Sin. The third thing, we're told, blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Another word, we've got to explain it. What is iniquity? Iniquity is simply twisted and something that's crooked. That's the way we are. Rather than obeying God, we go our own way and we twist our own hearts against God and we try to make what we've done acceptable in God's sight. We try to dress ourselves up. We avoid the consequences. We try to dive out of what God is saying to us. Again, example. Two kids in the kitchen. Mum and dad sitting in the front room. They hear something break. And they go through into the kitchen And there's a glass on the floor. Oh, the glass fell. The glass fell. 
until you ask the question, well, who made the glass to fall? The glass fell. The two kids, they're not taking consequences. They're not taking responsibility for what they've done. One of them, at least, has done. That's what it means, iniquity. We twist things around to avoid the consequences. And the longer we do that, the more unpleasant, painful, empty our lives can be. If you've got a boil, and I mean a really, really aggressive boil, it's red, it's enlarged, and all you've got to do is just simply brush against it ever so slightly, and it's sore. A boil keeping all the poison underneath the skin. That's the way David was. That's the way Adam was, going back right to the very beginning. Adam, he was told, don't eat off that tree. God walked in the garden of the cool of the day, and God judged them and says, well, who's eaten off the tree? Oh, it wasn't me. It was Eve. And he goes even further. He says, you gave her to me. It's your fault. Ducking and diving, getting away, explaining it away. And the more that David does that, what we're we told about David here, my bones, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. God's hand was laid on David's life, and David was feeling the pain of it all. It was personal. It was persistent. He says, day and night, it was 24-7. When he woke up in the morning, there was his guilt confronting him on the pillow beside him. When he went to sleep at night, closed his eyes, the last thing he thought of and saw was that same thing, the sin that he had committed. 24-7. He couldn't get away from it. His life was empty. That's the picture. That's the pain of his sin. No matter what we try, it doesn't work. And God, God will not allow sin to have the last word in the life of his people. God will not allow sin to have the last word in the life of his people. He shut. He whispers to us first of all, this is wrong. If we don't listen, he ups the tone just a little bit, this is wrong. And if we still don't listen, he comes in even more powerfully, he says, this is wrong. God will not abandon. God will not allow sin to have the last word in the life of his people. So what happened? The pain of conviction, we move on to the place of confession. And we're told here, yes, he was brought to that place of confession. And God does it in the most unexpected and surprising of ways. There's a variety of God's ways of working with us. Something Something in her memory that we've been given years ago. Something about the example of a parent, mom or dad or gran. Something that is there lodged is quickened, stirred. Something that was written in a letter. A comment that was made in a sermon. A variety of God's ways, but always having the same effect bringing us to the place of confession. What was it here? Well, David went to see his pal. Nathan went to see his pal, David. They were close. They were good friends. And there, Nathan told him a story one day. We've read the story. And at the end of it, all that Nathan did was, thou art the man. It was a pointing of a finger all was required to bring David to the place of confession. And what does he do? We see here these very same words 
that we've looked at and lingered on in the first few verses. But they're repeated here in a very different way. God has been chasing David for a year. Met up with him. Couldn't run, couldn't hide. Comes out in the open. And now he says, he confesses. What does he say? Verse 5. I acknowledge my sin and my iniquity. I will confess my transgressions. Things have changed with David now because he owns them. He sees God has opened his eyes and touched his soul and made him see these things are his possession. They are the consequences of his life. Things that once dictated how David lived all of these things that worked in his life have now been set aside because God is focused on what's important and urgent for him and for us. These three words, that picture is painted. It's got to be dealt with. And here is God dealing with it with him. Confession. Remember what we said about the boil? It's red. It's touchy. What's required when we've got sin in our life, like a boil that's welling up just like that? The doctor gets a knife, a scalpel, and lets the poison out. That's what God does with us. We brought it to the place of confession, where we confess the sins as mine. Not just simply distant concepts, not just abstract thoughts. It's not just sin, transgression, iniquity that we have in verse 1 that we have in verse 5. We now have David taking them to himself. And what does God do with the sins that are confessed? We're told that her sin is forgiven. What does that mean? It means forgiven, they're lifted and taken away. In the Old Testament, there was what's called a day of atonement. It was a great day in the religious calendar of the people. The high priest was there dressed in all of his robes and regalia. There was a goat taken in and put in the front before the congregation. And the high priest put his hands on that goat and there was the symbolism of all the sins of all the people transferred onto that goat. And then somebody took that goat out into the wilderness and it was released and let go and it ran away. That is what God does with the sins of his people. Our sins are transferred to Jesus. All of our sins wrapped around his life as he went to the cross. That's the only way our sins can be forgiven. Never ever will they be seen again. Only in that way will they be removed from us. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so God has removed our sins from us. Yes, our sins are forgiven. But not only that, he goes on and he says, our sins have been covered, concealed, out of sight, never again to be seen as we saw from Psalm 103. David tried to cover his sin. David tried to make himself respectable as well as Bathsheba. <laughs> An interesting thought. Go back and read that chapter 12 again. All verses we read, verses through 1 through 23, and not once, not once is Bathsheba mentioned. It's always Uriah's wife. It's always Uriah's wife. The focus was upon the sin that he had committed with one person. But how is it going to be covered? How is it going to be removed? 
never to be seen again. It is by the covering with the blood of Jesus Christ. We try to cover it. We don't work it out. But with God, it does. And there's an... There is a tremendous passage, a little verse given to us in Isaiah 43. Take it every time to yourself. This is what God says. I, even I, am he that blots outright transgression from my own sake. And then he says this, and will not remember thy sins. We have a phrase, oh, you've forgotten that. We forget things, and that's a sign of weakness. God forgets nothing. But what we have here, God is deliberately not remembering. And there's a world of difference between these two experiences. God is deliberately not remembering the sins of his people. They have been dealt with. And he moves on. And then it comes to a third word. Not only have they been covered, forgiven and lifted away. We're told in verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not his iniquity. Now that's a technical word. We've got to explain it carefully. To impute something is to take it from one side of the book to put it on the other. When you're making up sums, accounts, finances, there's the debit side and there's the credit side. The debit side is always in red. The credit side is always in black. And in the books of heaven, there's a book with your name on it and mine. And all of the pages there is a record of God weighing us up, taking note of what we've done. And it's all noted there for us. All the things We've done wrong. And to impute something means to take it from that page and put it onto that page. And that's what God is doing. He's taking our sins and he's putting them against the name of Jesus Christ, his son. Remember the licorice also. Our black is wrapped around the white. That's our sins transferred, imputed, to the name and the character of Jesus Christ. And he deals with that on the cross. But there's another way in which we can think of imputation because all of the good things that Jesus Christ has done, the perfection of his life and living, all of that is taken and is wrapped around God's people. So there's two transfers. My sin... To him, his goodness to me. And remember what I said about we need flesh and blood examples to understand it. Well, we have one in a small book in the New Testament, Philemon. Philemon had a servant called Onesimus, a slave. He robbed and he ran away. He came to Rome, became a Christian. Paul says, you've got to go home. And so he's going to go back home. And he gave Onesimus a letter. And in that letter, he uses very delicate, very simple, but technical words which help us. He says to Philemon, his master, here's your servant coming back. He's robbed you. And Paul says, put that to my account. Put that to my account. I'll deal with it. That's what he says in verse 18. But he goes further. And he says to Philemon, take him and deal with him as if you're dealing with me. Receive him as myself. And that's what God is doing with every one of his people. He's looking down upon his people in Jesus Christ, his son. And for his sake and in his name, he receives us 
deals with us, blesses us. So yes, we've had the picture on the pain of conviction, the place of confession, just briefly before we close, the praise from cleansing. There's never a song in the heart of the sinner. The way of the sinner is hard. People today try to tell you otherwise. They want to create the impression that they're content and they're happy and they're fooling themselves. Edison, who created the light bulb, he kept on coming up with mistakes and faults and failures in every experiment he did. And people asked him, why are you doing it? And Edison turned around and he says, I know 30,000 ways it doesn't work. I know 30,000 ways it doesn't work. And that's the conclusion of every Friday night and Saturday night that we have in our communities today. They try everything, anything, day in, day out, year in, year out, and it doesn't work. They've got nothing to be glad about. But the Christian has. Why? Because the Christian now has a change of status. Not from anything that we've done, but simply because Jesus Christ has dealt with all of our sin. At that cross of Calvary, it's level ground at the foot of the cross. Nobody has an advantage. Nobody is at disadvantage. It's level ground, you and I, at that cross where the Lord speaks to us and calls on us to trust in him fully, completely to deal with our sin. And when we come to that place of confession and faith, coming to trust in him, a change comes about in the way God looks on us. Rather than being the objects of his wrath, we now become the subjects of his love. Rather than being the objects of his wrath, we now become the subjects of his love. Everything that swamped us, pushed us down, the guilt that we had in our soul, we never spoke of to anyone else, but God knows it. It was there on our pillow at night when we slept and woke in the morning. It was there following us, tracking us every day, 24-7, day after day, all year round. But God has intervened and done something about it. He has sent his son into this world to take our sins to the cross and deal with them finally and fully. So therefore, when we come to the end and we come to verse 11, be glad in the Lord, yes, but it goes further than that. The psalmist says, and shout for joy. We now have something significant to boast of. We now have something we can share in. We can now have something that is permanent, lasting, deep, enriching. We know the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for our soul. Rich, personal, deep. He has forgiven my sin, my iniquity, my transgression. Goodness and mercy, Psalm 23 tells us, goodness and mercy has followed me all the days of my life. Yes, even when David had sinned with Bathsheba and he was a way off course, he was a way off line, even there, God did not abandon David, but followed David and took him back. Goodness and mercy following him. Goodness and mercy following us. And as we stand still from time to time, in Fort William, there's always that track going up Ben Nevis, and you could stop at points along the way and see the way you've covered. And you had a perspective, well, I've walked up that path, I've come around that corner, and you could stay there and you could watch things. We could do that ourselves. New Year, birthdays, anniversaries, there are pauses in our life, and we can look back and see what God has been doing with us and to us. 
And when we see his work in forgiveness and pardon coming upon us and giving to us, yes, goodness and mercy has followed us. And we can shout for joy for what he's done. So the question comes to you and I. Where we're sitting, what we're living, what we're going through. God has been speaking to us. Unsipping our life and looking inside our soul. Telling us what we're like. And telling us what we need. And drawing our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. His life was wrapped around with the sin of his people to deal with it and take it away. The question now is, can you, can I, can we shout for joy? Let us pray. Gracious Lord and God, we bless thy name for the riches of this gospel in our hearing in our head, but, Lord, also in our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that thou would bring it home to us and apply it to us, every one of us, different as we all are. But may each one of us go from our service this morning with a simple testimony that here to here and now, God has spoken to us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We close by saying from Psalm 51, one of these psalms that are associated also with the sin with Bathsheba, but it was composed immediately after that sin, whereas Psalm 32 is a year's distance. So we're going to sing from Psalm 51 and at verse 8, page 281. Of gladness and of joyfulness, make me to hear the voice that saw these very bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. All mine iniquities blot out. Thy face hide from my sin. Create a clean heart. Lord, renew a right spirit me within. Cast me not from thy sight, nor take thy Holy Spirit away. Restore me thy salvation's joy. With thy free spirit me stay. Then will I teach thy ways unto those that transgressors be. And those that sinners are shall then be turned unto thee. Psalm 51, verses 8 through to 13 of gladness and of joyfulness. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon and abide with you all. 
Amen.